Welcome to Series 40, everyone. We hope you had a good couple of weeks off, but we are back. Mm. The way you wrote that, Ryan, makes it sound like we're back to ruin your good couple. Like, you had a nice couple of weeks (laughs) off, but here we are. (laughs) (laughs) We've got a fantastic series with Neil Powell returning after 39 series Mm -hmm. uh, to discuss a game that he loves, Phoenix Dawn Command. Mm -hmm. Uh, But before all of that, as usual announcements. First up, uh, Chimera is still up for sale on the Itch page. Uh, If you enjoyed the last series, definitely check it out at play.chimera.games. But also my streamed campaign, A Tale of Twinkle and Awe, has its finale lined up (gasps) to stream live this Friday at 7.30 p.m. Central Time. Uh, We should be able to finish in a couple of hours, uh, but likely it'll go a little long, uh, but we really hope you'll all be able to join us for the fun. Uh, Currently, our heroes just finished learning some very surprising stuff from the spirit of the world they live on, and the evil capitalists are in hot pursuit to steal the magic that that spirit possesses. Uh, So I'm really excited to see how it pans out. Is there um, a page on Twitch, or do you have a YouTube page where people could catch up if they haven't... Before? Absolutely. You could go to twitch.chimera.games and actually see the entire backlog uh, if you so chose. Awesome. Then people can catch up in case they've they've missed it and they want to watch the go. finale live. The time, the time is now. <laughs> or is it? As we were just discussing before we started this recording. <laughs> the time, the time is might be later. It might be later. <laughs> uh, it will, the finale will also be there, but you can experience it live if you so choose. <laughs> Uh, Another announcement is that we are in the final few hours of the You Are the Dungeon Kickstarter. If you are listening on the day that this episode comes out, you can head over to the Kickstarter. You can smash the pledge button or gently just boop it, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Um, You can get yourself a copy. It is a fantastic game. I'm very, very excited about it. Mm -hmm. If you've already pledged and haven't checked back in a while, they did unlock the physical tarot deck goal so you can change your pledge level um upgrade that and get a physical copy of the tarot deck that Mm -hmm. dan and reedy is uh designing for this specific game Mm -hmm. um i'm really excited to get my physical copy of it i'm i'm so stoked yeah me too yeah it's really cool uh another one that we want to talk about is uh courier's call season two kickstarter is going strong right now they are in the last few days uh as of the release of this episode Uh, They've actually smashed past all of their stretch goals already. And uh, so it's it's really a great time to jump in uh, and get in on the action. Uh, Season one was a blast. Season two sounds like it's going to be phenomenal. Uh, It's going to actually include an Audrin prom. I'm so excited. uh, Which, like, yeah, like, how could you not love that? I was trying to explain to the kids, like... Because Nate's been asking me when the Kickstarter's coming. So we backed the Kickstarter and I was like, Nate, we did it. Um, and then I was like, oh, we're so close to Audrin Prom. And he's like, I don't know what prom is. Oh, no. <laughs> so then I had to like explain prom. So I think I might be more excited for Audrin Prom than he is, but that doesn't mm-hmm. matter. He'll be excited about the rest of it. And yeah. this thing can be for me. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's for adults, too. <laughs> it's for adults, too. It's true. <laughs> Um, I think that is everything for now. We hope you enjoy Phoenix Dawn Command. We recorded this actually before our Chimera series, so it's been a while since we've even experienced this ourselves, but I remember it being so much fun, Mm. and we can't wait for you to experience it right now. As usual, you can stay tuned after the show for our call to action, but for now, please enjoy the episode. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are excited to welcome back Neil Powell, co-host of DM Nastics and Whelmed, The Unjustice Files. 
to discuss Phoenix Dawn Command, a card-based RPG designed by Keith Baker and Dan Garrison. Neil, welcome to Character Creation Cast. You're back. We're excited yes. to have you. Yes. You <laughs> yes, made it. I'm very, I'm very <laughs> excited. It's been um, 40, so because I was here for the first one. So yeah. I'm very, very happy to be back, especially because we're talking about Phoenix Dawn Command. Absolutely. Yes, I'm really excited about this. It's such a fun game. <laughs> it's been quite a while since you were on, all the way back in Series 1 when we were just baby podcasters. Um, do you want to remind everybody what you're up to, where they can find you, all that kind of stuff? Definitely, yeah. So I still talk about D&D 5th Edition uh, anymore. It's just D&D in general. But if you go to your podcatcher of choice, which I like saying this everywhere I can, in my mind, that's a like a an entity like it's an actual pod catcher like with a, a net just going out there and catching them for me <laughs> but if you go you can look up dungeon master's block that and you'll hear my voice there or dmnastics where you can hear celeste conowich and i have practical ideas on how to just work out those mental mental muscles and of course whelmed the young justice files we're starting to ramp that back up after a short hiatus um and we have a lot of really interesting guests on the way for that mm -hmm. I also did a Kickstarter, I guess, um, since last time to, oh, yeah. uh, called the the Ultimate Guide to Hair, uh, a fifth edition supplement to die for. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. And so that's actually fulfilled. And if you really wanted it, you could go to Drive Through RPG, um, where you could get the PDF, and we're trying to get the um, physical copy approved for public public consumption, if you will. Very nice. Very cool. Awesome. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get into this, and we will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? All right, let's start with the setting. What is the setting for Phoenix Dawn Command? So, it's... Uh, I. In some ways, I want to say it's a fairly traditional RPG setting. And in a lot of ways, it's more it's the tools to build a traditional RPG setting in the way that you want to. Um, so as we noted before, Keith Baker is there. So he was the person that had created Eberron. And there's some serious Eberron feels hmm. in that the day. So the big thing with the Eberron is that there's the day of mourning where basically there's this hundred year war something something happens and it's key that i say it that way and a whole continent just kind of disappears mm. and nobody knows why that happened something very similar is here in that a nebulous bad known as the dread has taken over a third of the world in the past three years hmm. and the dread encompasses everything that you want it or need it to be is it undead is it skin changers there's the chant which basically takes over the minds of entire areas when they hear it and then of course the flip side is that you are phoenixes um someone that has died a glorious or at least extraordinary death and you have come back and you are the last bastion of hope to stop the dread hmm. There's a lot more lore. Uh, you both have the book. You know there's a lot more lore. <laughs> yes. that's, that's, the, that's the very basic yes. <laughs> yeah. premise behind it. That is a very big book, too. So, yeah. Uh, so what tools do we need to play this game, then? Um, your imagination. Uh, uh, so <laughs> the, the biggest thing... <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. So the biggest thing is... Friends, you, also. Possibly. That's the other one. Friends. Well, people you know, people willing to play a game with you. Yes. Um, not as many as you would think, though. We can we'll get into that because I've played this in a lot of different um sized groups. <laughs> but one of the biggest things is you you do have to buy Phoenix Dawn Command. It's a box set because one of the biggest differences with this RPG is that you have cards. Mm. Um, in a lot of ways, it's a pseudo deck builder, but uh, we were talking beforehand. One of the biggest things is that it's more like taking spell cards from D&D &D or other systems and just doing that with your entire character. Mm. Because even your, your class card ends up being like representative of where you are on the map, if you will. So it, like if if our all three of our characters were lined up next to each other, all three of us would put our character card next to each other. Mm -hmm. And then you would have the, the person we're facing or the NPC mm. and you could lay that card there and that can re give basic representation of where we are in space. And you do oh, that like with initiative and stuff too, don't you? Like in 
like combats and stuff like you move your like you put cards in certain places uh-huh. or am i totally i'm saying these things and i'm here yes. like mm. no it actually <laughs> it actually gets even both more and less complicated yeah. and it's one of the really interesting things about the game um i don't i i have so much knowledge i never know when to share it um <laughs> feel yes, free initiative. whenever so initiative is amazing and that that's where it goes back to i've i've played this with just two people so Ooh. myself and someone else because one of the things about the enemy cards is that it's based on speed and the speed rating is just how many player turns are taken before the enemy turn happens mm. so then it so if there were so the base concept would be let's say that the enemy has a speed of 2 if there were two characters, is that both this character- number down here? It, down so that's the the strength. So okay. on the back facing you, it'll say speed. Oh, look at that! There's all kinds of info on the back of the. Co- this is such a great podcast. <laughs> 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 But basically, if it has a speed of two, two characters would go, and then the enemy would go. Mm, okay. So if you had, so if you think of a, a whole round, if you will, the and there were four characters, the enemy would end up going twice in that round as you cycle through the four characters oh. taking their turns. Um, so it was really, like I said, it was really interesting to play with just two people because fundamentally all the concepts work no matter no matter how you were approaching that. Yeah. Mm. So all that to say, you really just have to buy the box to play the game because it has the cards that you need. It has the giant tome. Um, I switched to the PDF because it's it's a very big book. Yeah. Very yeah, nice. we did. Um, we were talking about that earlier, too, that because it all comes in a box and it has cards. I've played this game before, and when I opened up the box, I was like, this this book is huge. Because in my brain, it was like, it comes in a box. It must be a board game. It's a box. It has cards. It's a board game. And then it's got this, Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) giant book. And then it was like, oh, no. RPGs (laughs) have giant books. That's fine. But, like, for some reason, because it was in a box, that meant the book was too big. (laughs) I don't know. It was like I couldn't mash Mm -hmm. those concepts together. (laughs) Well, because I always store it. Like, I mean... I want to point over because my closet with games is in there. And that's like, that's usually where it goes up there with the other games. And so, like you said, it's got cards, it's got tokens, and then it has a giant tone. Yeah. Well, I have a an RPG shelf and then I have a board game shelf. And this one was on the board game shelf because it's in a box. <laughs> yep. So it's Starcrossed and it's, it's in a box. So mm-hmm. what kind of stories and themes is this game meant to explore? That is probably the toughest question you have for me thus far, because one of the things is, I think from, okay, we'll go stories and we'll go themes and maybe I'll do a good job. So one of the stories (laughs) is that, again, you have this overwhelming dread in the past three years, it's taken over a third of the known world and you have these phoenixes who long ago they were just prevalent everywhere then they basically tried to rule the world with an iron fist um and were basically secluded off to an island and now there's not as many but they're trying to come back and help save the world a world that doesn't necessarily believe they're real anymore because they've been gone for so long so from that perspective i think it's again it's you can do some pretty standard rpg stories from that lens because again anything you want to be in the dread is in the dread Mm -hmm. um but what i think is one of the really interesting things and the reason like i love character creation for this is that the themes you get to explore through that process are really deep about both the character and and end up being really deep about you and how you're approaching that because the whole conceit is like you have to have died at least once to start and you're going to die again to level up like Mm -hmm. that's the level up mechanic is death and it's how did that death happen and what do you look like after the trials of that death Mm -hmm. so like the again the stories end up being some classic rpg stuff with that element of just deep deep introspection on like who your character is and why they're making the choices that they're making Mm -hmm. so then what do characters actually do in the game then they are epic um so that's the other <laughs> thing. that's the other thing um because because you started out as just a normal a normal person in the world i mean one of the examples is literally like farmer soldier child like you could have just been a child and for whatever reason it was um some of it makes me and this is not this is a very thin analogy but it kind of makes me think of um oh man the 
I've connected dots in a weird way in my head. What's the Groundhog Day movie with Tom Cruise? Tom um, Cruise. Where he, where he where he dies, he's a soldier and he dies, but it gets the alien oh, yeah, blood on him. Oh, uh, that's um, gosh. But they changed the name. They did that's change the name. We... It was um. Oh, don't think I won't. I'll do it. Gosh. <laughs> it, Edge of Tomorrow. Edge of Tomorrow. That's right. But then they changed the name to something else that really threw me off. But it's that same. It's that same kind of concept like your but even to the nth degree because now you're you can do things that no normal human could even dream of and as you continue to progress the you become much much stronger but the other thing is that you only have seven chances for that to happen yeah so after that seventh seventh death that character is just gone mm. forever but it is also the level up mechanic. So then you do need to and so <laughs> right. you just get farther and farther out to that edge um, as you get more and more powerful. Oh, goodness. Um, so, yeah, basically they can do and will do things that no one else could do. That's very cool. So our next question is, what is unique about this game? I think the level up mechanic is one of them. Um, yeah. And the way that, like, this is one of the first games I played where um, the like progression mechanic and story tie so neatly together and it's become a thing that like since then i have really really wanted in games um and been really frustrated when they when it's just like you get some xp and you can buy whatever you want with it Mm -hmm. um whereas this one is like they are directly tied to what happens in the game um so i think for me that's one of the biggest like unique pieces what do you no i wholeheartedly agree because one of the things i mean a very common D &D thing is that i i or someone would know like this is my thought of what my character progression would be over the next 20 levels and i've mapped that out in my mind maybe i've even mapped it out on D &D beyond and i just click back and forth through my levels or things like that but one of the things about it is that it's it's based on the death that happens in game. So there's there's theoretically no real I mean, you could choose to do something in that moment to to gain the death that you're you're hoping for. Mm. But you could also die in a way that you weren't expecting that would then dictate in a brand new way what you're adding into your character, because these are the things that are actually happening to your character. Right. Your fir- if you will, your first death is always the most important because it is what defines you as originally coming back as a phoenix. But then what's happening with you and the other people in play is defining what's happening going forward. Hmm. So I and well, then, of course, cards. Um, right that's the other thing it comes in a box so yeah it comes in a box with like pseudo it's like pseudo deck building and i I think it gets framed too much that way Mm -hmm. um because it is more of just a character sheet broken into cards Mm -hmm. right Um, it's yeah it's just the things that are like you would write on your own sheet and they've written them down and you grab them like yeah and there's a little bit of a it it does end up having a little bit of a deck building feel though because i can see what's in my hand mm-hmm. currently so i can i can always do something but there are those moments when i can see that everything's kind of lined up and i can do something if you will legendary mm-hmm. and so then everyone can kind of know what, it, what everyone else has and then knowing oh, okay so i could just do a regular turn or i could do this above and beyond turn we all have the right cards together and then like i said we go we dip into that legendary territory Hmm. so this is the part where we talk a little bit about the history of the game um i i saw that it was kickstarted in 2015 uh, and finally fulfilled in 2016 um i was tickled when i when i saw the kickstarter and it it said we're gonna have a 120 page rule book um and all these cards it's gonna be great uh this is a 460 page tome (laughs) Um, (laughs) it's heavy this thing could knock somebody out um it's uh it's it's wonderful i i love i love the heft of it i love uh the quality of the pages and stuff like that but um is there any it's not 120 pages it's not 120 (laughs) pages no Uh, which is fine uh better to over deliver right um but is there any other uh history of the game that you know of uh neil so that's 
so that's one of the biggest things is that it was the Kickstarter and then it was fulfilled. And then, so I'm realizing now that I, I played it pretty early and I had the privilege, thanks to a catacon. Mm. Um, the first time I played it was with Keith Baker. Oh, nice. So, cool. Um, that helped. Yeah. Uh, it definitely helped like <laughs> learn and immerse and, and do all, do all of those things. Um, and it was either very shortly or while they were fulfilling. Cause I can't remember the first year I went, but I know it was the first year I went, um, from there. The only, the only big thing that's happened is if you go to drive through RPG, you can go and you can basically buy an expansion to, cause in the box, you can only, there are six available characters but you could only play four at a time. Mm. So if you go to drive through RPG, you can buy the cards necessary to be able to play all six at one time. And it comes with the extra resource cards as well as a few additional traits. So that's really the only big addition to the game since it's come out. Mm. I know that he has wanted to do things, but uh, Together Studios um, has done a lot of really interesting things. Like they're the ones doing the Adventure Zone board game mm. um, and things like that. So they've had a lot. Certainly. A yeah, lot they did Illumat they too, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. which that thing was gangbusters because it was with the Decemberists and everything mm-hmm. like that. Um, as well as, of course, Keith um, is, did the Wayfinder's Guide to Ebron. I'm sure he was really helpful with Ebron The Last War. And he's been putting out different really high, high end DMs. He's a busy content. dude. Yeah. So mm-hmm. he, he's got a little bit going on. So <laughs> I know it, his thought was at one point to circle back around to it but i'm not sure where that all sits so again the biggest thing would be buying that from drive through rpg very cool uh this is the part where we go over some quick terms and concepts that people might want to know as we go through character creation just so nobody's confused um a couple that ryan pulled i'm not going to say we i'm not even going to pretend i had anything to do with this ryan got all of this together these are actually mine so i put them in there too well there you go neil neil handled it um look i was busy falling down some stairs thank you both (laughs) for (laughs) putting all of this together oh yes (laughs) um so let's start with crucible definitely so the crucible is what is going back to that element of what really makes this setting and everything about this different so again the base level concept if it is we'll just use i'm i'm me i'm a person in this world i die maybe it's at the hands of the dread maybe it's something along those lines and rather than going to whatever afterlife i'm chosen as a feat is the potential to be a phoenix and i go into the crucible and the crucible is basically a place where then i learn and train to become a phoenix Mm. now that said i love the crucible it's it's sometimes difficult to explain because it gets super Mm timey-wimey instantaneously because the amount of time that happens in the crucible and the daylit world as it is called are not equitable Mm. in any way shape or form um, in that the example it basically uses is you could have died 300 years ago and you're coming back as a phoenix, but it felt like you spent a couple days in the crucible. Oh, and, and the reverse could certainly be true. You could have died a couple days ago and it felt like you spent 300 years training in the crucible. Oh, interesting. And so once you're in play, because you are basically an active group in in the world you will come back at the next dawn but that same conversation about the time that happens in the crucible while you're training to level up is still true so you could be coming back at the next dawn and again it felt like like one or two seconds i mean it's whatever you need it to be for your character or it could have felt like you spent another hundred years in the crucible oh wow So, and when you return from the crucible, and this is my favorite thing, is that what you look like and how you present is everything up up to you. Um, uh, One one of the things that they usually do kind of suggest is that over time and over those levels, your separation from your humanity does start to stretch out because you do have all this power that comes from next term, the flame. So basically, (laughs) it's the flame that you're attached to going back to the the Phoenix analogy and things like that. So you're attached to a specific flame. Um, And I guess also in the crucible, which is also 
I guess, part of character creation, which we'll get to, um, is that you have a mentor who is also attached to the flame hmm. and has has done kind of the same things as you and they're teaching you. And how are you attached to them? Did you know them before? Or did you not? Um, so then we'll also use the term sparks maybe at some point. Um, so that I guess this is another concept for Phoenix that's really interesting is that you have both health and sparks. So if you lose all of either one of them, you die. And you can choose to spend um, sparks. Like if you're like, basically if you're, let's say, five away from something legendary, you could spend five sparks and it could also be your last five sparks. Mm. And so then you're choosing to complete this legendary action, but then you're dying um, in the same way. Oh, interesting. School wing rank. I put all those together. So your school is based. We're just going to use D&D terms to make all of these work. Yeah. Your school is totally your class. Your wing <laughs> is your group of characters. Your rank is your level. Um, and then Marshall is just the DMGM term. Um so it's the person running the game is known as the marshal. Um, I feel like, yes. Did that spark any questions? I feel like I went really fast through those. It, it yeah, seems pretty like... self-explanatory. Yep. I have zero uh, knowledge of the system before this, aside from you dying and you come back. Um, yes, and which was true. So you, all the knowledge you had was 100% true. That's Look true. at that. So, so that's all I'm coming into it, and this is all making sense so far. All right. So is there anything then else then that we need to know before we uh, dive into character creation? I don't think so. I think we are, we are primed and ready. Oh, I'm fantastic. so excited. Shall we make some people then? Let's make some people. Let's yes. make some people. Let's make some people. I'm so excited for this. I haven't gotten to play this game since like 2017. Mm -hmm. um because all of my gaming is online and it is a little difficult to do this one online i have thought through that very concept and i see nothing short of like something really official happening through like an online service because you just mm -hmm. have so much tied to physical aspects yeah you'd have to almost have something like through roll 20 with mm -hmm. uh, the custom cards or uh, uh virtual tabletop yeah mm -hmm. can do that as well yeah. well and i know that like you offered to cover this game with us back at the very beginning too and the whole time yeah. we were like how are we gonna do that and then finally <laughs> ryan and i now both have the game and so we're like now's Boom. the time <laughs> now's the time we can do it uh-huh yep. all right okay so how do we start how do we uh what do, what's our first step tell us what to do neil <laughs> i've got a bunch of cards here i don't know what i'm doing Good. Help. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Step one is that we all need to select a school. Ooh. So basically, and it's tough. It's tough because it's, again, it's the most important choice you're about to make. So we're doing it right up front is because basically you're defining what your first death was. Mm. So the other thing is that in each wing, you can't repeat a school. Okay. So if I were to choose a Durant, a Phoenix that has died because they aren't tough enough and the lesson they learn is to be stronger, then that would no longer be a choice for either of you. Okay. Um, so, so so it sounds very uh, powered by the Apocalypse-esque where you can only have one playbook at a time in play, usually. Yeah, and, and the other thing is that basically the, I guess... The one thing I did miss is that you have three attributes, which are strength, grace, and intellect. Um, again, going back to the D and D, intellect is going to take over um, intelligence and wisdom. Strength is basically going to take over um, strength, surprise, and constitution. Mm -hmm. And then gr grace is taking over basically both physical and social grace. Mm -hmm. um, so it's both dexterity and charisma. That makes type. sense. Um, so everyone has grace and then it's whether or not a class also has strength or intellect and you can only have two of, of either a strength or intellect. So basically we couldn't all pick strength um, schools or all pick intellect schools. OK. I'm okay. sorry. The rule book says it. The tome. No. But basically, <laughs> the tome yeah. half declared. Yes. So basically, it's just deciding um, what kind of death is our is our initial death. OK. So, yeah, I see um, like on the page 130 of the rule book, it says 
the the six different schools, three of them are strength and grace, three of them are intellect mm-hmm. and grace. Yeah. Okay. And then just not not that it really matters for this conversation, but or for this exercise that we're doing, but um, often the base game because if you you can anyone that wants to you can go download the iconics which are pre generated characters, um, but the two that they leave off are the forceful and the elemental. Uh, they're a little bit more complicated, so mm-hmm. those aren't um, in the pre generated character. Are you willing to give me? A quick explanation of what each one is. Yes. For can... for our listeners, definitely not for me, because I totally know. <laughs> for our listeners, Neil, <laughs> could you explain definitely. what each of these schools is? <laughs> yes. So you have the Durant, which ends up. So we can talk from more of a mechanical perspective to kind of help out. Um, so like I said, you're not tough enough. So you end up being kind of the tank of the group. So you're willing to get out there, take more damage. You're you're harder and tougher to ki- tougher to kill, um, which ends up being a super interesting mechanic, of course, for a game where you need to die to level up Mm -hmm. um so that's the durant the devoted ends up be so die for others and they learn to strengthen and defend their allies so the devoted ends up being a little bit more like the cleric um so sometimes you can basically take the damage of others and redirect that damage back to um the enemies that you're Mm. that you're up against um the forceful die because they either aren't fast enough or can't overcome an obstacle so they end up being kind of like a ranged archery type is one of the uh, like ranger feel to it it is probably the easiest way to say that elemental is a phoenix that dies for duty as they burn their very life force to scour away the enemies of the empire and that one ends up being what kind of mage do you want to be um, hmm. you could be or or you could go the route of more um, like shamanistic or or things like that but it's more of that elemental kind of spell casting set uh shrouded that's a rogue um die due to secrets either in pursuit of secret knowledge or because a secret was resolved Hmm. or revealed sorry um and then the bitter which is the newest school um phoenixes die in failure they're angry um so that's more of your barbarian uh and they're actually more effective the less health they still have Hmm. So again, now you're running it. Now you're like, it's kind of the opposite of the Durant where you're running it close to the edge because then you're more powerful based on the health you've already lost. Wow. Oh, that's really interesting. There's a lot of uh, good choices here. Uh, I agree. I want to be the shrouded. Yes. That makes sense. I I feel like that's what I played when I played, but again, it was 2017, so I don't totally yeah. remember. Mm-hmm. But. Oh. And yeah, see, I remember I played a, a, a bitter in that in that game and i've played so i've played in and ran um the intro scenario quite a few times because so that that's kind of my go-to like if there's a local con Mm -hmm. um, i'll usually sign up to run phoenix and then i'll just run that intro one Um, but i played a bitter that basically jumped off like a two or three story banister and just straight down into the the like big enemy at the time um killing them and dying at the same time so it was wonderful i Mm. enjoyed it very much so i don't have to play the better i can certainly i can certainly choose anyone Mm -hmm. um i am ready i'm uh i'm between the durant and the devoted i think probably leading towards the devoted of course Mm -hmm. yep Yep. we all we're all shocked we're all shocked i know i i wanted the play to type this time (laughs) <laughs> that's what i said i was like i feel like the last couple of times i've like tried not to yeah um and you know like played nice things and i was like nah s- secrets secrets <laughs> yeah nah no 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 secrets secrets you know what let's <laughs> let's do it let's i i think i think because other things are so different i think that the convenience of all three of us playing to type is probably the best choice i'm gonna pick the better all right nice. Does that work out? We have intellect and grace. Ryan, what are you, intellect and grace? Intellect and grace. And, and then, then your strength, strength and grace, grace right? Cool. Yeah. yeah, so basically... Look at me knowing not. the rules. Yep, I could not have chosen mm-hmm. the elemental. Would have All been right. the one I could not have have chosen. I find this uh, interesting, the way they lay this out. Like, um, they, they set it up almost like a lot of board games are set up, too, where it's like, hey, read this verbatim, 
to your mm -hmm. new group of players well, yeah. to set the it, setting. And then here's another verbatim thing to read for each of the schools. Very, yeah, very um, he heavy on the potential box text. Yeah. Um, which is, yep, that's a whole conversation. Because some people, some people really want it because they feel empowered by it. And I know other people don't like it because they feel beholden to it. Mm -hmm. My thing is always just like... It, you do you. Yeah, which, which I... Keith which, Baker is not coming to your house to check if you're reading the box though. text. That would be super awesome. I'm okay if you want to. I mean, to. yeah, Keith, um, anytime, Keith, you're more than welcome. Like, please do yeah. call me before you come. I'll yeah. clean up a little, but... <laughs> but even even having done the Dungeon Masters blog and DMnastics for, I mean, at this point, it's going on six years. One of the things that I've only come to recently is that some people do view the written, the written word, if you will, as law. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know. I just wasn't. I wasn't raised in RPGs that way, and I just didn't know that that's how some people approached it. So, um, yeah, it is important. Like, in you both are looking at a lot of different games and seeing it from a lot of different perspectives. But it is important for any designer to know that some people will approach what you've written as straight up law. Mm -hmm. Like, people will not do certain things inside Fifth Edition until it's in a Watsy published material mm -hmm. they right. won't touch it and i'm just like but why <laughs> like you said you do you anytime you want because when you sit down to play monopoly though you're like you read the rules True. and those are the, i mean i guess not monopoly everybody else has and, the, and then you turn but like, uh, free right. parking into a place where you get money right yeah and then you, then you turn like, into shrouded and you stab them <laughs> right but like almost any other board game like if that's where you come from you yeah. you look at the rules and those are the rules and so like yeah. it it is a little bit, I think, depending on the way you played or, you know, any of that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. I'm watching my brother start trying to GM his first game, too, <gasps> yeah. and he's, like, texting me, and he's like, I don't know. I think that, like, maybe my GM wasn't a good GM. Like, did you know there's all this stuff you can do? And I was like, <laughs> buddy, there's a whole world out there. <laughs> like, there's a whole world. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so... Another place where I will say both both are totally right, mm -hmm. but I hope that over time everyone ends up leaning more towards just doing exactly what's best for you and best for your table. Yeah, but I definitely can see you like having the comfort of like, I'm not good at improv. And so, you know, mm -hmm. even like having that text in front of me that I can kind of paraphrase is hugely helpful to somebody like me and like eases a lot of my anxiety too. So I think... Yes. I can see it being good for people. And I know that RPGs, sometimes um, designers are kind of trying to like bridge that gap mm -hmm. too. And this is another one that I think yeah. starts to bridge that gap. The new um, Fiasco edition does that too, where it's a lot of mm -hmm. cards and like has yeah. a board mm -hmm. and it's still played like an RPG, but like is that middle ground. So people who come from board games can be like, oh, I recognize what this is. Mm -hmm. It has familiar pieces. Perfect. Okay. Also... I really there's a thing that you guys don't like doing, but luckily this the because I've listened to enough of the yeah. show that this <laughs> helps both of you. We're not going to name our characters until we better understand our characters. Also, the naming of the character is kind of tied to how your how who your character is as a phoenix. It's mm. very. Um, uh, it makes me think, oh my gosh, how did I never... Thank you both. I've never connected these two pieces together. It's totally how Warforged are named. Um, mm. that, so, like, often a Warforged will have a name that makes very visual or um, social sense for the Warforged itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, the standard character in the Eberron that you have as an NPC, or no, I just made it. Their name is Maul, and they just have a giant Maul mm -hmm. that they use to hit people. Um, so, like the devote the Durant that is the iconic, is, that's the pre generated, is called Shepherd. Mm. Mm. That makes sense. And so, so that that's kind of how you how you approach the naming convention is something along those lines. Mm. Um, or it's like, what is the yeah the bitter is named Wolf. So, we'll we'll eventually get there. But I just wanted to say up front, don't worry, don't worry about is, it. Okay. Yeah, naming is, is really <laughs> don't easy start thinking one. about it right now. Yep, yep. 
interesting. So, yeah. So one of the other things is we might jump back and forth because there's two ways to approach this is one is like the what's in the tome. Um, and then there's also the player guide, which you can download for free on Together Studios. Um, I, I'm not endorsed or nor do I work for them. But um, let us see. So one of the things. Oh, OK, never mind. I see where it is. We'll just follow the book. Fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I see where it is. Okay. So we've all decided on our school. Yep. Mm-hmm. So one of the things about the school is that, again, like I said, like I've mentioned before, it's, it's like your character sheet. So you have core cards that just come with the school. So those are the things that you can do no matter what. Hmm. So what cards am I looking for? So on the bottom of the card, it will have the symbol for, um, so you chose devoted. So it'll have Mm -hmm. um, the devoted symbol, which kind of looks like a circle with six lines, kind of like a sun coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And on the very bottom, it will say core. And so then you'll have three three cards. Those are your core. So basically one is going to be kind of your um, skills or your your skills slash specialties. So like for me as a bidder, one thing that I have is athletics, fear, shadows and death and then if i use one of these when i'm doing a skill spread um again so i am playing cards to complete a skill uh of some sort if i can say how it ties back to one of these four um i can add five to that total oh. so i found three cards that say core and yep. devoted uh okay. one's a talent one's a skill specialties and one's combat style correct Okay. So then, so then, when you're looking at that com- combat style, that also tells you how many cards you can use in that spread. So the basic, the basic term, I guess, the term that we'll just stumble our way into that I forgot in the beginning is a spread. So it's the cards I'm laying out, and so your three sets are attack, defense, or skill. Mm. So basically. You're attacking, you're defending, or you're trying to complete a skill. Um, And your combat style is the number of cards that you can play in it. Um, So you could play two uh, intellect cards for an attack or two grace cards for a defense. Yes. And you also have a special attribute in there as well. Hmm. And there are several talents to like different ranks of talents. Mm-hmm. Correct. So for for right now, also, if you can go ahead and find both of your rank one cards, um, because you will ultimately need to decide between one of those. Oh, so many choices. So I, I found a whole bunch of those as I was going through and then I just passed them up because I wasn't thinking. Uh, OK, so that's a rank one. There we go. Interesting. OK. So then as you as you level up those cards that are that are listed as rank two, rank three, rank four, you have to be that rank to be able to select those. Okay. Um, interesting. So, yes, ultimately, you will have the you'll have your your main card, which basically, again, that describes your your school as a brief overview and also is used as like a a reference point of where your character is on the table. And Mm -hmm. you'll have the three core cards and you'll have to choose between one of the two rank ones okay so i've got um i guess we can list off what we have for our core for the audience that's Mm -hmm. not familiar with the game uh so we kind of know what we're talking about here um so uh i'm the devoted and uh do we want to like go through these in alphabetical order for whatever sure cool so for combat style, um, for the devoted, I've got um, attack, intellect, so I can use two cards of intellect for attacking, um, or defense using grace, two cards for that. And my special is on a successful attack, I can transfer a number of wounds equal to half of my rank, rounded up, to your target at the cost of one spark per wound. Uh, each wound inflicts three brutal damage to your target. Now you can only do this to living targets. That's really interesting. That's where that's where that that spending of the sparks kind of comes in play, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So part of it is basically you're wounded, and and there are scenarios where you can also take wounds from another character. Yeah. But then you're using your your spark, your energy to transfer those wounds to the person you're you're fighting. Nice. 
Uh, and then brutal damage is also the <laughs> so everyone has health points and basically it's a, a certain number of points and any points spent over that that don't then take out another health token are wasted unless you have brutal damage which basically says that even one into those would take that out Ooh. so then brutal damage is very nice it, it, it's brutal one would say it is <laughs> one would <laughs> one could say that i guess yeah. <laughs> so are we each taking our combat style or we yeah let's uh, let's go round robin perfect so i have reaper's fury where for attack i can use strength or grace for and then use two cards for defense i can use grace for two cards and my special is that anytime i suffer a wound i can draw one card hmm. So essentially, the the bidder ends up being able to build out a bigger hand to start choosing from pretty quickly. Oh, nice. What do you got to be there? Uh, my combat style is Cryptic Blade. Uh, I can attack with two intellect um, and defend us three grace. And then uh, after, you after you successfully defend against an attack, you may become hidden. Mm -hmm. Very nice. All right. Uh, skill specialties uh, for the devoted. I've got spiritual guidance. Um, it has uh, diplomacy, healing, spirits, and tradition in bold. I'm assuming mm -hmm. those are the the kind of the skills that I'm working with here. Yeah. So then anything when you do the skill spread, as long as there's a justifiable reason why it ties back to any of those four, you're going to add five to that spread. Nice. Okay, and you may use grace cards in any skill spread involving your specialties. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And then I have strength and shadow, and then I like I mentioned before, athletics, fear, shadows, and death. And then mine is the additional five, as well as using strength cards in any skill spread involving my specialties. Nice. Mine is master of intrigue, deception, lore, observation, and spycraft. If you use one or more of your specialties in a skill spread, add five to the total. You may use intellect cards in any skill spread involving your specialties. Hmm. So we're, it feels like we're kind of well-rounded there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And that, yeah, which is one of the benefits of like you can only choose one character from the school. Well, you also, I mean... You also just simply can't. You don't have the cards to do it any right. other way. So, I mean, it's written in there. I mean, you could certainly have, if you were me, you would have more than one box. And in theory, you could have larger wings and multiple. Mix from the and same match. Or, so, yeah. But essentially, you're, you're, you have to do it that way because you don't have the, the physical resources mm -hmm. to do it any other way. That makes sense. Um, and finally, our talents. Um, so, I've got shared strength. Uh, when you make a spread, you can use any one card as a grace card, regardless of its actual suit. Uh, when a wingmate makes a spread, you may discard a card from your hand, add the value of the card or your rank, uh, whichever is lower, to the spread. And during your turn, you may burn one spark to transfer any number of wounds from any adjacent ally to yourself. Dang. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Ryan, that is your jam. Yeah. <laughs> It is exactly a Ryan card. That's what that is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I have bitter strength where you can same deal where basically I can use any one card as a strength card, regardless of the suit. Uh, and then when I make an attack spread, I add my current wounds to the total. I so have... I don't want you to take them. I want to keep them for a bit. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have hidden secrets. When you make a spread, you can use any one card as an intellect card, regardless of its actual suit. The draw limit is increased by one card. Hmm. Nice. All right. So now, now we're on to rank one uh, cards for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm torn, right? Uh, because one of, one of mine's a combat style, the Shining Mirror, uh, and one's a talent, the Devoted Bond. Um and the shiny mirror allows me to attack with grace, Ooh. Um, which sounds like okay. it's good because it sounds like grace is like something you can have a lot of to utilize. Yeah, so because every yeah everyone will have grace. Yeah. Um, 
So that might be good to help out in combat, but the devoted bond bond is pretty cool because um, you can uh, put sparks equal to your rank plus the number of phoenixes in your wing onto this card, and then any phoenix in your wing may return one of the committed sparks to you on their turn to regain two sparks or draw two cards. And in addition, any member of your wing can send a wing, send the wing a short telepathic message uh, mm -hmm. where you'll then burn one spark because of that. Um, what, so it has like massive like group utility there versus I can do better in combat. I say you choose that one because I'm going to do better in combat. Okay. I'm sure of it. Okay. I'll, I'll choose the devoted bond then for my rank one. Um, we all know that's what you wanted anyways. It, so. it is. <laughs> Brain's all like, how can but, I help my teammates? And I'm looking okay. at my cards that are I, like, I you really, can steal things from your teammates. I <laughs> mean, to, to be fair, the shiny mirror is extraordinarily on brand too, because that's one of Sailor Neptune's main weapons yeah. is a mirror. Yep. So, I mean, it's it's there. But I'll I'll forego that for now and go with the devoted bond. So I will choose the bitter bond um, for my rank one talent. Draw one card any time one of your wingmates suffers one or more wounds from an injury. In addition, you always know how many health levels your wingmates have and since when one of them is wounded. Ooh. Can you do anything about that or you just know? I just know. Okay. Is there, is there like a distance on that? Or you, is it just like no. if you're no, hundreds but... of miles apart, it's like, oh, my friend just yes. got hurt. Correct. That's that's same, same with the telepathic message because so one of the other things is that basically there is a a travel system that can be used where there's the main fortress basically on the island called Pyre that we are all starting at and you can basically step through flame and show up somewhere else but it's a one way trip so that nothing else can come back through um, and immediately be in Pyre. Mm. Um, so then you could step through see something and say i need immediate assistance or everything's fine and so you could spin that spark telepathically let us know or the, the reverse could be true we don't have a devoted who took back that and i immediately sense that whoever went through is wounded so yep. now i'm using that bond and yeah there's no um there's no range on it also it's it, it's a concept I find very funny because it's like, I've sent you across the land, but you got to walk back. Right. <laughs> and, and I get I get the safety element of it. You don't want anyone to just magically show up and you're in the middle of your fortress. Um, so, yeah, you got to you're on foot patrol after that. Mm. I have to decide on my talent. You've already decided. But go no, on. I really haven't, though, because <laughs> I have one where it's like. When you're hidden, you may burn one spark mm. on your turn to appear next to one of your wingmates, regardless of the distance. Ooh. Um, yeah. When one of your wingmates dies, you can take one of their skill specialties and use it until they're reborn. Oh, wow. Yeah, right? So that's pretty do cool. You know, do you know why? No. Because, like, conceptually, we kind of, like, ghost haunt you. Like, that's, that. like, while you're dead um, and before you're reborn if you had sparks left over you can still kind of use them um but then like let's say <laughs> you use them all up then your like creepy ghost version disappears but like until that moment you can like if you had sparks so yeah it's basically if your health gets knocked out but you still had sparks you're like kind of haunting the area if you will and you can give those to other people until you give them all out and then you disappear that's amazing until the dawn it's <laughs> so good um or, once during your turn, you may use an environmental element to become hidden. Instead of drawing a card, you may do this immediately at the start of combat as long as you aren't surprised. Anytime you make an attack while you're hidden, you may add an additional card to your attack spread. You know what? I don't know why I said I hadn't made a choice. I'm definitely going with that first one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like the second one's got to be really, really good for this, this first one. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, so one, of the, so one of the other things is, because I didn't know where to talk about it until it came up right now. So using the environmental elements, one of the things that you do, which this is a thing that I've just kind of started, or a base concept that i've started using in other games D D and the, and the like there's something called the torch 
And basically, like on your turn, you have the card that is referenced as the torch. And there are certain things that are listed there as elements that are in the area. And you can use those and then gain more on your skills and things like that. But they're sort of a one time use. So if it were like so one of the intro scenario, there's like this candelabra basically so let's say i pick it up and i stab somebody with it because i'm the bitter of course i did um <laughs> basically i can get a benefit from that but now i've used it mm. so it's no longer available on the torch but it's like immediately giving everyone something to interact with so you could have hidden behind it and then use that environmental element to then jump out and stab somebody mm. oh interesting yeah is it a thing that you can like make them like multiple use like you can put is it, you can put tokens on them or like say that like it has so many uses or something like that or am i thinking of something else no you you certainly could because yeah, it, it's really just to set up the environment like so there's somewhere deep within this set of cards are blank ones that you could totally use like um dry erase markers and you mm. just write it out real quick and then you can either put check boxes next to it or uh, mm. check next to it or letting the the characters know that they can have two uses um depending on how it works or what element is there gotcha so this is something that the, the marshal would introduce to a scene like say oh there's a piano here there's a this other thing that you can utilize and yep uh and and whatnot and and yes. i halfway to describing a saloon right now yeah so the, well, <laughs> there's the, a the piano funny, there's like, a nope. bar there's a couple of bottles of whiskey <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the funniest one I was going to also bring up is that in that intro scenario, when you do step through um, and you're in the room, one of the things is a big taxidermy to bear um, that you can use. And so do you push it over? Do you hide behind it? What do you do? And hmm. so that, yes. Same base level concept is, um, yeah, because you could exactly like you're saying. So then if we did even want to say that there's a saloon, because there's no reason that there wouldn't be, there's the piano, there's the bar, there's the alcohol, like what whatever small or big element that you want to add to that torch and then hand to the players um and it's also representative like of whose turn is currently happening that's really interesting it, it feels a little like aspects from like fate or whatever that you're setting mm -hmm. up in a scene uh that can be utilized that's pretty cool okay so the other thing that i totally didn't have you do that we should do now is that we also need to pull out two traits Ooh. so each each school also has two level one or rank one traits and these would get added into the hand that we make or into the deck that we make spreads out of um so i mean i can i did some some pre-sorting because i use because my box is fairly sorted so i can totally tell you what what yours are if that's helpful what is what what am i looking for on a does it say trait right on the card no so you're looking for these two, right? You're looking oh, for... Oh, Grace and Grace. Um, yeah. Okay, see. So, oh, yeah, they were in this other pile, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're looking... Ryan, you're looking to choose between Savior and Heart of the Wing. And I actually think you're going to have a difficult choice with that. So there you go. Once you start reading what both of those can do. And the Shrouded has... Psychometry and hidden motion as the two options. Mm. And I, as the bitter, have ruthless and reckless. And I also will have a hard time deciding. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out where these are in. Um, oh, I think I found Heart of the Wing. Okay, so it has a little symbol on the bottom for my yes. my school, the devoted. Yeah, and, and you'll be able to, and you'll see that you'll get the get more of those at other ranks. As okay, well. and it's and um, it's one, uh, and it's yes. the one that has there. Okay, because I'm seeing like rank five. Ooh, rank seven. I just want to read this real quick. Um, okay, I don't know what that means. <laughs> What's that? I was just reading the rank seven. I'm like rank seven. That's got to be really good, huh? <laughs> um, but I have no idea what it means. And then the funniest thing is, of course, at rank seven, it would only be that you you had a devoted death that you would then choose from. Mm -hmm. Oh, these ones are all mixed. So I have chosen Reckless. When you are targeted by a melee attack, you may discard this card to launch an immediate attack against your opponent and then draw back to your hand limit. If your enemy survives, they can complete their attack and you cannot defend. Oh. But the other interesting concept would also be that if they die, they don't. Hmm. So then basically, like, as I'm getting attacked, I make a reckless attack. And then if I 
if I defeat the enemy, then it basically stopped them cold. Oh, interesting. So it's kind of a an interrupt almost, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, to use a Magic: uh, The Gathering term. Yes, but if they but if I don't do that, then I they will complete their attack, and I will not use any defense cards. So okay, but you still you still hit them, right? You still hurt them. Yes. Okay. Exactly. So it's just like I'm opening myself and hoping to finish this, but it might not. But then again, you're the bitter. So what do you yeah, care? What do I care? <laughs> <laughs> Reckless. Yep. Hmm. Okay, so you what you were saying uh before is these go into your like potential spread, right? Um where Yeah, because they have because they have the the one grace or one strength or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this one, yeah, Heart of the Wing, it's uh when you use this card in the spread, draw one card, and each of your wingmates may burn one spark to add three to the value of your spread. So it sounds like you're 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 relying on your your wing to help you out in your in your spread. Yep. Effectively. Yeah. So you're you're gonna do something, and then we all decided to burn a spark, and then each of us are adding three. So then it, that's where you start to keep, like get higher and higher mm-hmm. the numbers that you're completing in either a skill attack or defense spread. Okay. Um. And then the savior is uh use this card in the spread, draw a card, and then I can discard the savior card. Uh, at any time to add five to uh, the value of a wingmate spread. So that sounds like I'm helping somebody out yep. with that. But then I lose the card. No. Do, yes. Do yes, you, no. Do you lose the cards if you use them in a spread? No. So you basically you're gonna go through so you're gonna go through the deck and as you're making spreads, you're putting them into the discard pile, and then once you run out of cards to draw, you shuffle your discard and start back over. Oh, so you can get it back eventually. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. cool. So then that's why it does even feel like even feels even more like it's just your character sheet, because basically you can just keep you just keep drawing through that same mm-hmm. deck as you play. Interesting. Okay. I think I'll go with Savior then. Uh, to allow me to help the team better. Shot. That sounds fine. I know. So I know these are like totally uncharacteristic. I don't like this at all. <laughs> <laughs> I've written one thing down uh, in my notes, and that's my school, and everything else is on a card. Yeah, and you technically didn't even need to write that down because you have a school card. I know. <laughs> yeah. Which I didn't know when I started this. Yeah. Once you yeah, once you've created the character, it all just exists in that deck. There's nothing. There's no character sheet per se. It's just that deck of cards that you have in your hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, eventually you could write down a name, and if you wanted to, a backstory. But mm-hmm. other than that, there's nothing you should need. Yep. Hmm. Um, I don't know which one of these I want to pick. For psychometry, I have. You may discard this card and burn two sparks to learn the history and purpose of an object you are touching. When you use this in a successful attack spread, you may burn two sparks to make the target vulnerable for a scene. Or hidden motion. When you use this card in a spread, draw one card. You, If you use it in an attack spread while you are hidden, you remain hidden. Mm. Nice. See, I personally love the psychometry stuff. Uh, but that goes back to my Palladium Heroes Unlimited days. Mm. Uh, and well, then I'm definitely not days. picking that one. Uh, well, <laughs> no, one of my one of my favorite spells, or uh, not spells, it was a, a psionic abilities, is Optic Read because it lets you like see scenes from the past and stuff, mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. was really cool and really helpful whenever mysteries were involved in play. Yes. So you could do so, you could do something very similar with with that one where you're either choosing to do it in or out of combat, and so you're you're learning more about the object in a lot of ways. It's the identify spell, but mm-hmm. you could definitely play it out with more of like you're seeing these images happening, or then you're basically figuring out the exact spot to stab somebody. Mm-hmm. It's of course the the other version of of that. It's a lot of sparks to burn though. <laughs> just like it yeah. mentions two different times burning two sparks it's just a lot of sparks i think i'm gonna take that one though because it does seem more interesting than just staying hidden mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like while useful is not you know exciting mm-hmm. call to action yeah like that 
This was my first exposure to Phoenix Dawn Command, and I am really loving it so far. It it took me a bit of time to understand how all the cards worked. Mm-hmm. Um, I, like so much searching through my very messy decks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I think I picked up on it about halfway through uh, finally. So uh, it, it definitely less me searching for cards in the next episode, I hope. Yeah, it's a little bit weird to kind of pick up on when you have all of it in front of you and you're like, I know I can only pick a third of these, but like yep. I have all of them. <laughs> it is it is a weird thing to do. Uh, Mm -hmm. remotely i did recently learn though that there is um there are some online uh possibilities i think in tabletop simulator maybe oh yeah Um, most likely yeah i'm trying to remember somebody recently told me Mm. uh but But options are out there i'm yes they're out there and i'm i'm very excited because like this was i i remember having such a great time playing this game so i hope everybody enjoys character creation too once we get past the card finding (laughs) exactly it tightens up well at the very least we do better Mm -hmm. i promise (laughs) uh but before we head out for this episode uh, we do have a few call to action items for you to think about uh including a new review or two to read uh since we finally found a chance to record together again Ooh, I'm excited. I forgot about yeah. reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Our first announcement is to check out the final hours of the You Are the Dungeon Kickstarter. It's such a good game. Um, and they now have physical tarot decks that you can add to your pledge if you would like. If mm-hmm. you're listening to this on release day, Monday, June 7th, Tracy is doing a wrap-up stream tonight from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Eastern. Um I don't know what that is in central time. Normally we say things in central time because that's what yeah, we're in. Eight, eight um, to two. It's eight to two. There you go. I didn't want to do the math and mess it up. <laughs> I didn't want to ruin things. Um, but that will be over on their Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash the other Tracy. Um, they will have surprise guests dropping in and out over the course of the stream to help create the dungeon. Who knows who might show up? Yeah, mm. I I really love how this solo RPG is just able to embrace tons of people just hopping in and throwing in details. I know, I know. It's, it's so fun. It's such a cool game. Like, it's mm-hmm. such a cool game. Ugh. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of cool games, uh, you can also stop by play.chimera.games to check out my game, Chimera, uh, if you enjoyed the last series. Uh, speaking of, uh, Amelia, we never got a chance to talk about it together during the call to action, uh, the last series at all, because we weren't able to record the cold opens together. It's true. Due to scheduling snafus. It's true. Um, Chimera was amazing and her brilliance was probably like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> One of the best characters that I've ever made, but also the worst. I, um, I really, I, I'm going to so have to try good. and find an artist to to get some character art. Done. I don't like, know. I, always I don't want, know. <laughs> I always want to do art of our characters, but I don't think I have ever wanted art so badly yeah. as I do. Oh my gosh. Danielle it's Michelle. Got, it's it's going to be like one of those pieces of art that's just going to be like, how how does this person exist? They're going to hang it in the Louvre. uh, I know. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's going to be old Renaissance Um, Because she deserves it. Okay. (laughs) Yep. Yep. (laughs) Oh, no. Honestly, I had so much fun with that series. Like, that was... Mm -hmm. It was phenomenal. I know those episodes were long. I really hope people were able to, like, hang on there. Because I know sometimes people are like, "Mm, two hours is too long for an episode. Mm -hmm. But, um, oh, God. What a good time. What a good time. Oh, it's so good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, I, I really want to play those characters so bad. I know. I know. Oh, my goodness. Someday, maybe. What a mess. We'll see. We'll yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> well, next up, uh, remember to check out the Courier's Call Season 2 Kickstarter, uh, which only has a few days left as of the time of this release. Uh, you can check the show notes to get right there as well. Finally, uh, we have a new review to read for you. Two actually Uh, if you want to leave us a review we've got links in the show notes to various platforms Uh, this time I'd like to highlight a couple of reviews from Podcast Addict Mm -hmm. um, both with five stars Uh, this one from Hill Sorcerer is it Sorcerer? is that Sorcerer? perhaps Sorcerer probably Sorcerer Sorcerer. Hill Sorcerer (laughs) Um, (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm so bad at reading usernames and screen names. I just want to apologize to everyone in advance because it's, it's like fine. words mashed together and I can't do it when the words aren't mashed together. Mm-hmm. So just, I don't read compound words is what I'm saying. <laughs> this review says... I like this podcast so very much that I had to figure out how to review shows on Podcast Addict. Great show with friendly, fun, interested hosts who have introduced me to several great new games. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, and thank you for the review. It was lovely seeing those pop up on uh, Podcast Addict, uh, which I, I check every now and then. Absolutely. We also have a second review from uh, Moosenstein, I believe. Excellent name. Excellent. Yep. Uh, Moosenstein wrote, Amelia and Ryan are great. They're a good way to learn about how to play in new new systems. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, the I love short reviews that are just like, hey, hey. listen, it's great. Here's, here, here's the thing. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, and every single review helps. So uh, definitely leave one if you have the chance to wherever you are able to. Uh, we would really love to see those. Definitely. Um, that is all we have for today. Uh, we will be back next week. We are thankful to have all of you here with us. And we can't wait to share the rest of character creation with you guys. Um, this is such a good game. I love, mm-hmm. I love this game. I want to play more it's, of this game. I know. I feel like I say that every time. But <laughs> until then, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Keep making amazing people. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Asians Represent. Asians Represent celebrates Asian creators and diversity in the gaming community. Join hosts Agatha Chain and Daniel Kwan as they discuss gaming, genre, and representation with their guests and occasionally argue with each other to the sound of Agatha's beloved Airhorn app.